Hi, I'm Noah Kadner, and I'm a writer for American Cinematographer Magazine. I'm the author of the Virtual Production Field Guide, and I'm the host of the Virtual Production Podcast. And I'm thrilled to be here today with leading studio executives to get their perspectives on how virtual production is taking the film and TV industry by storm. We have a great discussion lined up that will cover how virtual production is impacting decision making at the studio level, the creative opportunities that virtual production affords, and where they see virtual production evolving from here. So on today's panel, you'll be hearing from Christopher Cram, Senior Vice President of Visual Effects at Universal Pictures. Chris Del Conti, Global Head of Visual Effects at Amazon Studios. Garish Balakrishnan, Director of Virtual Production at Netflix. Linwin Brennan, Executive Vice President and General Manager at Lucasfilm. And Sherry Hansen, Senior Vice President of Physical Production at Paramount Pictures. So let's get started. Uh, Chris, um, so at the executive level, it seems like virtual production demands a new approach to budgeting and scheduling when compared to more traditional workflows. Um, have you observed this and how do you address it? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank Epic for having this panel and uh, for everybody else who's joining me on the panel. And thank you for the question. I do think this is an important discussion to have about virtual production technologies and how we bring them into our production pipelines. At Universal, um, we're, we're laser focused on helping filmmakers tell their stories. And we want to embrace any technology that helps us help them do that. And we are really excited about the, um, the possibilities that Game Engine brings for that. And we are looking at all the different ways we can employ it, uh, whether it's in pre-production, whether it's in shoot, or, or even some post-production tools. And uh, we see it actually as a, as a cross-disciplinary, cross-functional kind of thing. So when we look at virtual production, we have someone from visual effects, we have someone from physical production, we have someone from post-production, and even now we have people from facilities looking into, you know, what does it mean to have our own volume, you know, versus what does it mean to go rent one? So um, that's our studio's approach is to bring people from all different disciplines and all different backgrounds together to look at this, this game engine and say, all right, where does it fit in and uh, how can we make the most of it? Excellent. Garish, uh, Netflix obviously has a global footprint and um, I can only imagine the volume of content being created must be massive. Um, can you talk about the role virtual production plays in establishing best practices and processes and what the benefits of this are? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, uh, also to echo, so appreciative that uh, you guys are putting together a panel from different studios, really getting these perspectives in order because I think we're all creating content around the world to be able to enable these. And we all see virtual production as playing a, a role in that sort of content creation process. Um, I think to echo what Chris was saying earlier, we think of virtual production as just production, right? It's just a method of creative problem solving enabled by new production technologies. And it helps connect all of these disparate parts of the production process together and organically brings visual effects earlier into the conversation, help our filmmakers reduce the blind spots, increase the creative engagement, and then helps unlock these production efficiencies throughout our shows. And, you know, I think historically only the flagship titles are the, were the ones that could access these workflows. And I think something that we believe really uh, deep at, at Netflix is that it should be accessible to anyone, anywhere, at any budget, across series, features, unscripted animation, uh, and around the world. And so to do that, to your point, we need to help build and drive the industry towards open and accessible standards and best practices and guidelines. And so uh, we started something uh, a little bit ago called NLAB, which is our uh, virtual production R&D and technology initiative, where we partner with technology leaders like Epic uh, to help standardize pipelines, battle test a lot of these emerging tools and, and aid in help democratizing these workflows for, for all of us to end up using. And we wanna make sure that we're in lockstep with the industry uh, and with our productions to make sure that we're enabling our filmmakers with the best tools, but the tools are not being created in a vacuum. There's a feedback culture between the technology and the productions to help drive the innovation forward. Okay, this next question is for Linwin. Um, so Lucasfilm is well known as one of the pioneers of what we call transmedia, i.e. Um, movies, comics, toys, ancillary markets. 
Um, but in trying to achieve this, it seems like there's some friction and inefficiencies over having to build and rebuild assets over and over again, depending on the use case and the facility. Um, are there specific ways virtual production can address this? Well, I think that um, it, it's certainly true that Lucasfilm has always been a, um, a believer in um, cross-media content uh, generation. And the, and the fact is, is that we've become very practiced at it and it has gotten um, a lot easier for us to think about the whole world building that we are doing. So um, right now we use our virtual um, uh, backlog that we call it, that when we create assets, we create them it, with the idea in mind that they will end up in all of these different platforms. So we might create an, an asset for visual effects, but be able to automatically um, output it in a way that makes sense for a real-time engine, whether it be for VR, AR, or if for our games content and vice versa. You know, we, we bring in assets from all the different platforms that we're working on and we, we store them together on this virtual backlog. So, it, it is less of an issue now the the um, worry about having to recreate. Does that mean that there is never any recreation? Of course there is. That there is there is recreation, right? You know, it depends on many many things. You know, when we work with our um, virtual art department in virtual production, sometimes we're creating assets that can go straight up on the wall. Sometimes they won't stand up on the wall. And it could be just because of the speed that we had to get them into the virtual art department and we didn't create them with the level of resolution. Um, so it's all evolving over, over time. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I think it will end up being reduced over time, the amount of, of recreation that, that you need to do, because it all comes down to what the director or what the DP or what the production designer wants to see. And the sooner we can get that in front of their eyes um, for them to, to comment on and then be able to re reuse their vision on all the platforms, the better we're off, we're off we're gonna be. But it's, it's even in this past few years, it's come so long and then it was so far than it was five years ago. Chris. Can you talk about efforts to educate and generate awareness about virtual production among more traditional production teams? Absolutely. Uh, so yes, first of all, thank you, Epic, for putting this panel together and uh, to all the other panelists. Um, at Amazon Studios, we definitely look into you know, future technology and virtual production as a solution and a tool to use for both our AOMs, original movies, and our series. Um, we've definitely seen uh, in recent you know, months that you know, getting traditional production stakeholders to understand the benefits of virtual production uh, and utilization has been a task. Um, a lot of them are come from the traditional filmmaking side where they build a set, they set it up, they, they can shoot on that, they, they can schedule that out, they know how many setups per day they can get. So to try to get them to understand the benefits of virtual and understanding you know, the asset building that needs to happen beforehand and, and the prep work, but then also the utilization of being able to set up multiple different you know, sets on a virtual volume wall uh, in a day and what the benefits are. It's hard for them to kind of wrap their head around the idea that technology replaces a lot of the set building and, and understanding that. And there's one project we had recently where we actually created a CG model of just the volume wall and the parts of the set and then had a witness cam and kind of showed them the different camera angles and the witness cam of of what they wouldn't have to build and how much would be taken over by the volume wall and that that spoke a lot to the, the, the creatives the filmmakers the creative execs on just what the volume wall could give them both in time of setups during the day and what they wouldn't have to build um, knowing that they had to build assets and everything beforehand. So I think a lot of that, uh, you know, that understanding is going to be something we're going to be doing over the next uh, year, year and a half in virtual production to kind of educate uh, filmmakers and, you know, line producers. And again, with COVID, you know, Amazon's looking at all the different safety protocols that we have and usually go above and beyond the safety protocols that are even recommended in different regions. Uh, and to speak to that, obviously, using virtual production, uh, you're able to do a lot with possibly less people on set, not have to travel crews as much. So a lot of those benefits are things that, you know, Amazon's looking to to have virtual production kind of help you know solidify in our productions that we do uh, going forward. So my final question is to Sherry. Um, you have a very strong background overseeing high profile and tentpole films with major visual effects. Uh, now that you oversee physical production, you seem uniquely positioned to leverage the background that you have and bring visual effects more directly into production. Can you speak to those opportunities that that provides? 
Sure, um, and thank you. And I wanted to say thank you also for, uh, uh, and it's so nice to meet everyone here and to see old friends. Um, as a physical production executive, my job is to support the filmmaker's storytelling goals with the best possible tools to achieve and capture their vision. And to me, virtual production, the most exciting part of it is bringing um, the collaboration between the filmmakers, the director, the producers, the cinematographers, the production designers, and the visual effects team um, forward in the process and um, together. So often these, these departments and these people are working um, you know, along a timeline that may be months or even years separated between prep and shoot and then the visual effects production and post-production finishing. So virtual production allows them, uh, all the collaborators to work together early and entirely on the creation of the film. Um, the interpretation of the designs and the decisions made in prep and on set are no longer mysterious to the visual effects artists that are working in um, dark rooms uh, uh, late into the night, late into the schedule. They can um, participate in and uh, collaborate in those decisions, which I think is wonderful, particularly, um, you know, it can be applied to all size projects, film, te television, media, but particularly for large tentpole films, you're talking about thousands of people that are touching every pixel and uh, bringing all of that forward. It, it allows the, the filmmakers to um, enlist their talents um, and uh, inform the decision-making, inform the buy-in. Um, it, it helps inform the studio on what they're gonna get and in my opinion, can ultimately put more resources towards the quality of the picture, the quality of the film and the production quality instead of wasting resources on um, changes and uh, uh, expensive changes in post-production. So, okay, let's start with an easy one. Uh, what are some advantages that virtual production offers over more traditional workflows? Who wants to take that? I'll start back what I said previously that, you know, safety is really one of the biggest things for us, you know, not having to travel crews, being able to do, you know, virtual remote scouting, remote previs, tech viz, even asset building, all that is done, you know, within the confines of different crews that don't have to be together. So I feel these newer technologies like virtual production really speak to our day and age of, of wanting to maybe isolate crews and not have people mixed as much. And, you know, both social distance and crew travel is limited uh, when you utilize a lot of virtual production solutions across the board. I would add on to that, um, that um, on the Mandalorian, for example, the, the scope and scale that we were able to get in that series using the volume and, and uh, you know, a backlot, it looks like we traveled the world or the galaxy and we didn't. We were able to, to do that all on the volume. So I think a huge advantage is the creative flexibility that it gives to your filmmakers um, and the fact that it brings, as Shari was saying earlier, it brings more parts of the production into the development phase and into the production phase. So it feels like a more, an even more collaborative uh, medium. It, it's an expansive creative tool, which I think is one of the main advantages. I think it also democratizes to some degree what filmmakers can do. And I think because the barrier to entry to sort of have the engine and start mucking around keeps coming down, I think you get a lot of filmmakers who are able to get um, a lot further, a lot faster with uh, the story that they want to tell with the sort of the visioning of that story, whether it's this kind of virtual previs, even before we get to like the volume and all that. Just, just in previs land, I think filmmakers are able to get there much faster with a with lower tech and lower cost. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting because I think that allows us to open the door for more kinds of filmmakers to tell stories than the, the ones who normally sort of get their access through the way of cash flows and, and producers and this kind of thing. I think we're gonna start to see a lot of uh, filmmakers being able to noodle around and create some really cool stuff that's gonna get our attention and, and possibly get people some directing gigs. The volume allows um, the cast and crew and the filmmakers to, to travel to far and distant lands that maybe because of budget constraints or health and 
constraints they may not have been able to do. And so whether that's a, um, you know, a fantasy environment um, or a real environment, I just remember the first time I stood on the volume and we were in the middle of the Tunisian desert and it's magic hour, um, you know, to have that, to the, have the ability to allow filmmakers to go places like that where they could maybe never have dreamed to go uh, and making it accessible is is just a huge advantage to filmmakers and also you know there's there's a lot of environments um that you don't even exist uh like space you, for example a lot of movies want to shoot in space and as far as i know nobody can shoot in space really now with actors and probably if they did it wouldn't look spacey enough and so you, the ver the volume allows you to curate your space or your alien planet and allow your actors to sit there and uh interact from the safety of the volume and maybe from the safety of their own hometown the volume is such a powerful and incredible tool and it's it's like to what we all say it's a tool in the in the sandbox of the ecosystem but i i, I don't think of virtual production and traditional workflows or traditional production at odds with one another at all. And, and really it's about the, the way we talk about virtual production, I think all of us do, is it's all about uh, empowering our talent with basically superpowers. You're basically giving them uh, the right tools to be able to see their content before they make their content. Uh, in some sort of fashion, whether it's in remote pre-production uh, with, with talent around the world, whether through virtual scouting, whether you're using an onset uh, compositing system to be able to see a creature that you wouldn't be able to see in real time, or if you're in, you know inside that Tunisian desert, it's that what you see is what you get sort of philosophy that uh, enables production designers and cinematographers and grip departments and uh, art directors and just artists and visual effects folks to really see the production process unfold before them from the very beginning and help studios like uh, like all of ours be able to demystify the production process so we know what we're going to be getting as the production moves moves along. I think that's a really good point, uh, Garish, and I I, I would. Um, um, definitely emphasize the fact that that it isn't an either or. Um, oftentimes in our productions, we are doing a lot of more traditional production as well as having a virtual volume. And in some of our productions, we're out when it, it they don't doesn't really make sense to 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 use the the volume. Um, and uh, so they, they live in harmony. But I do think um, that there are part, parts of uh, production that I think are much more powerful on the volume. And one big example of that is the, the difference between a big green screen um, or blue screen set versus a volume. And to, to your point, I think it, 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 you're ex exactly right. What you see is what you get. And that is hugely important, not only for the directors and the creators, but for the performers. The fact that they're able to truly feel like they are where they, you know, where the visual effects artists in, in post were going to make them be, they're actually there. That has a huge um, um, beneficial effect, I think, on, on their performance. So um, I think that, that that point about it being a really, um, you know, tactile um, medium is, is, a, is a really good one. I love that point because I think the experiential nature of it is so critical. I mean, we had this uh, amazing Korean film that is that's coming out later this year where you you enable a tool to be able to see a something physical appear uh, in 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 kind of like a void. It's not in a volume, but it's on a practical set. And for a for a director to be able to work with talent. Uh, and work on a practical set and live composite elements uh, so that the editors and everyone can see what the what the creation needs to be. Um, it's it's a picture is worth a thousand words, right? It's it's uh, language is challenging, creative intent is really challenging, and these tools of uh, these virtual production tools really help break those barriers down in a way that we haven't seen before and just being able to interact with something that isn't real. You don't no longer see a tennis ball anymore. You see uh, you see an intent of what that tennis ball was supposed to be. 
uh, you know, in, in camera, which is great um, as well. Yeah, I was going to I was going to say one of the, the great experiences about it is um, watching a director, um, or um, in the case with virtual production, the cast see innovation and new technology um, add to their performance and the, their experience. And there's nothing like seeing that bright light of realization in a filmmaker's eye or in the performer's eye when they realize, oh, my gosh, I get this and it's going to make my film or my performance and I think going back to what Linwin said because we've spent many many years on um on combating the green screen void and I think once um we, we can recruit enough traditional filmmakers and actors to understand that they are going to be immersed in their environment and that's going to enhance their performance they will join the whole party yeah, and I think even in development or, or pre-production, if you, you know, the typical pre process before was you would have the director maybe do some storyboards and then the, the pre company or the pre artist would take that over and they would sort of build this vision. And the DP, meanwhile, is finishing their last movie. They're in the DI on their last movie. They haven't even gotten here yet. And then by the time the DP and maybe the production designer get their hands on the pre they're like, hey, and this is fine, but here's what I would do differently. And we've sort of maybe spent some money on, on, on the previs at that point, And we've crafted this thing that, you know, we thought was going to be the, the plan, but what this allowed with game engine, you know, we can develop it together, you know, with the multi-user tool and having everyone collaborate as Linwin and Sherry are talking about. And not only that, but we can also drop cameras and change things and, you know, do the dynamic lighting and make the DP feel like they're actively participating in a sort of, I guess it's like a prototype of the film really, you know, which is stuff that's really hard to do in Maya, but is, is a lot easier to do in the engine. And once they feel like they're sort of pre-lighting or, you know, buying in on this, the hope is that that, that pre can serve you as a better recipe for the actual making of the film. And maybe you learn things more in that pre than you do uh, when you normally shoot and then edit and then go, oh, I missed a shot and, you know, I need a close up of this. But you can find that so much earlier if your lighting is right, you know, um, you know, DPs can find out, well, if I put the light here, suddenly I want the camera really over here. And those are things the engine can really deliver for you, you know, in real time that I think traditional previs or, you know, the regular previs hasn't hasn't been able to yet. And as we talk about uh, traditional workflows too versus you know virtual production, I do want to go all the way to the end here because obviously on the editorial side, you know when Amazon is trying to get content onto our platform, you know we have multiple multiple series that are in post. The idea that we're getting shots that are nearly finished or finished, being able to be cut in to be able to test with. I mean, there's a lot of benefits for having shows not having a VFX step on a lot of the shots and a lot of the sequences to be able to move right through and and not be able to cut down some of that time uh, for the uh, packaging of the shows to to go to the platform. So I see a big benefit there as we go forward. I mean, I've spoken to many, many um, folks uh, in various walks of filmmaking about this, and it seems like there are far more benefits than there are downsides. In fact, I, I don't really hear a lot of downsides. It's the, the, the people who are really leaning into this are reaping the benefits because as you say, there's just so many ways that it assists the process, makes it more of a shared experience and more efficient and ultimately more cost-effective and resulting in a better project. So. So yeah, it's, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a downside no at, at all, but it, I, I, I want to make sure that um, we make the point that it does take planning. Um, a lot of the things that we, you know, we're so used to, oh, we'll just fix it in post. We actually have to plan and commit to up front, which is actually more efficient. And I, I actually think results in a more creative, collaborative um, re result. But but you, it does involve a lot more uh, a, a lot of upfront planning that that um, you know some decisions can be um, in more traditional filmmaking can can be left later on through the process. Um, but there's another um, benefit that we've seen as well, and that is reshoots. Mm -hmm. Even in our productions, which have been done in a more traditional way, if you make sure that you've got the environments photographed and you need to do a reshoot you don't have to pull up that whole environment again you can put it on the volume and get a much a reduced crew and and reshoot some of the elements that you need to 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 capture in post as well so that's another benefit 
or there are a couple of other, I think, challenges that we have to acknowledge about it at this time. I do think like all the things we're talking about, there's definitely a lot of this is there's a lot of promise to this and there's it's definitely going to deliver on that at the in the current moment. I think there are still some some hurdles to overcome. I think one of them is sort of the availability of these volumes. Um, what it takes to to ramp up and build a volume is quite expensive and needs to be amortized in some way. So whether that's a production that can only, as we talked about with, with a fantasy environment or a space environment where it really should be done that way because you're gonna take full advantage of that volume or whether it's a volume that can be used on multiple productions or a whole season of a show like Mandalorian. I mean, these are, these are the things that make sense right now, um, but sort of, you know, I don't know, pop-up volumes aren't a thing yet. I don't think that there's enough talent yet. I think ILM would recognize this as I think they're they're starting to train up more people. Um, and then I think that's that's the that's the other thing is uh, game engine people who really know the game engine well tend to be people who work in games. And um, a lot of people who they have a um, knowledge base for how to make the game engine deliver the best video games. And when they come into the film world, it's a totally different language in some ways, you know, thinking in terms of shots and, and, and angles and things like that. And so I think that's another challenge that we have a sort of, um, we have to have a big knowledge transfer where the, the film people, the people who are used to traditional visual effects for films have a lot to learn from some of the game people. And the game people have a lot to learn from the traditional VFX people for, before this can really synthesize. And I think that that is ongoing now and will continue to go for for at least the next couple of years. I want to concur with, with Chris that yes, that one of the big disadvantages for if for, for those of us that have more limited resources or content or means is, is the access and resources being available. I know that will change very, very quickly. And then looking at, um, you know, the slate of a whole studio or a whole film and television studio and trying to find exactly that right project or group of projects that's going to optimize the utilization of the volume in order to make it cost effective and to be able to amortize it. It's, it's, we work in a bespoke industry. Every project is unique. And so we can't force the creative to fit on the volume and not every single creative is exactly right for it. Given this platform to speak directly to the industry, um, what roles and skill sets are you looking for as you build out a virtual production team or teams? As Chris said, um, I, ILM is is expanding. You know, we're we're building three more volumes around the world, and our limitation right now is having enough skilled um, artists to create assets for the volume in real time engine. And also a, a crew to, to, to run the volume itself, to, to run the brain bar. So we need, uh, we need artists and we need um, uh, technical skills. And we, we are doing um, some training and apprenticeship programs because the other big challenge, I think, in visual effects is the complete and utter lack of diversity in visual effects. This is actually an opportunity, a growth area in our industry right right now and if we can really get behind being serious about developing a pipeline into the industry for these new roles and tapping into diverse skill sets but also diverse people to bring into the industry i think it's a huge opportunity so that's why we're putting a lot of effort into apprenticeship programs um, because these are these are really new skills that we can leverage a lot of skills um, learned in the, in the games industry. We can leverage a lot of skills learned in the visual effects industry. And we can also leverage a lot of skills of, of people coming out of college now who are digital native and are just flying when they, when they get into this workflow. So I think it's a great opportunity for us right now to, to really um, bring more people into this industry. Yeah, I mean, at Universal, we're talking to Epic about ways we can bring this technology to a more di diverse group of filmmakers to kind of bring them through and sort of say, here's this technology that's available to you that you may not have thought about employing on your, on your types of movies because you thought maybe this was big visual effects technology, but it's really not. It can be used, as we talked about, in all kinds of productions. And so we're looking at ways to do that. But as Linwin said, it would be great to be able to do a call to arms to say, look, Epic's done a great job of making this engine available to almost anyone, you know, with a with a fast enough computer 
And um, they, there's a lot of tools available for, for how to learn it. And, you know, there's a lot of enterprising people out there and we just have to get the message to them and reach them and say, look, with a, with a relatively fast computer, you can learn everything you need and, and we need you and we need to start employing you. And I think a lot of these jobs, even more so, are going to be in California for a while, which is something that, you know, the visual effects industry has hollowed out a little bit in California since, I, since I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And I think it would be nice to see a flourish of new people having jobs here, um, you know, through through virtual production stuff. And just to piggyback on that, uh, I would just say, you know, call it to Epic for for doing your Unreal Fellowship. I mean, I think that's going a long way to kind of really put the knowledge out there on the ground level to, to a lot of different people that normally wouldn't have access to that. And I already know a couple of people have gone through the last version of it. I know people that are in it now. And I'm talking to all those people about potentially, you know, being employed or being involved in some of our shows going forward when we utilize volume walls. So that knowledge is definitely something that's going to be something that lifts a lot of these different uh, groups up and, and, and gets them in a place that, you know, they're working, you know, within these giant volume walls and a capacity that is needed. I mean, you know, I do have a lot of companies out there reaching out to me that are building their own walls and it seems to be the thing now. Everybody that uh, has VFX offerings is now going the volume wall route and, hey, we bought panels, we got it set up, we'll be ready in three months and we'll start doing shows for you guys. Uh, and the reality is the LED panels is only a small part of it. The reality is it is that, you know, brain bar crew and, and it is everybody, the technical side that runs it. I mean, that that's the end all be all to make sure that everything on the day works correctly and you're able to get the content you need and, and have it work the way you want it to work. Uh, and honestly, I don't want Amazon Studio shows to be the first show on your volume wall if you've never done it before and that makes me nervous so you know a lot of that expertise needs to be at the forefront of uh these these offerings and i think the fellowship goes a long way to to help promote that plus one the the nature that we're kind of in a reset moment in the way that we think about production fundamentally but we're also in the reset moment and how we should be thinking about talent for our shows uh, in terms of, like we were saying, to diversity and inclusion. And we have this opportunity, I think, across all the studios to be able to enable, you know, the democratization of these tools from a high end to low end from a creative standpoint, but also from a talent perspective. And so, you know, I always think of virtual production as this intersection between games and film. And you have this giant Venn diagram in the center where you have, you know, some of the, some of the folks that come from games are, are mindful of performance budgets in engines. They're, they create strong, high quality assets really uh, early and really quick. But at the same point, visual effects artists and visual effects uh, technicians and, and onset operators, there's a great retraining opportunity to be able to transition folks from different industries to enable these sort of, these sort of processes. And I think onto the, the what roles and skill sets. I think for me personally, the, the biggest thing I look for in, in Kenneth's at, at our studio, but also across titles is folks that are honestly rational and honest uh, because, and don't fall too much into the hype of what is, what is going on. You know, at the end of the day, virtual production is going to stay on for, for decades to come. And I think what we're all looking for is creative problem solvers and nimble thinkers at the end of the day. We want someone that is as witty and smart and being able to keep their, uh, finger on the pulse of where things are gonna go. And as virtual production continues to move more like physical production in the near future, and as this transition occurs, the technical literacy, not only in education uh, opportunities in schools, but also education opportunities that studios should be providing to, uh, to our talent and our below the line crew and our above the line crew, and this is, is vitally important uh, all the way in, you know, from editorial to art department, uh, costumes and et cetera, to be able to find new ways to be able to tap into these workflows. And I think there's a real opportunity in every single facet of the physical production workflow and even in animation for aspects of virtual production to be tapped in. So there's a great talent opportunity, I feel like inside of there uh, that we can certainly leverage the, the fellowship program, what ILM has been doing through their Jedi Academy program, through other programs uh, at, at cities and universities around the world, we should be uh, continuing to tap into that uh, for our own content. I also wanted to give just a small shout out for the the, the traditional physical production um, below the line crew. It's another opportunity for people to train in a different area. I, I actually don't look at it as, as there's any difference between virtual production and physical production or visual effects. It's all production. And I think there's whenever there's new technology in filmmaking, there's always a fear from the traditional um, below the line crew that somehow there's going to be job elimination. Um, it's pretty evident with virtual production. 
very little change in terms of the footprint of your uh, the people that are on your set. It's just they may have moved from one side of the room to the other, and there's opportunities for them to use those incredible traditional skills to apply towards visual production. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that that is what I'm hearing. And you look at productions, you know, um, obviously The Mandalorian is a virtual production, but much of the actual work on the day is done by crews that have no direct connection to the screen. They're, you know, they're just a regular movie crew. They're doing their lighting, they're moving around a camera. So Same it group really does. And, props and sets and stunts and, and all of those people are still, yeah. <laughs> they're not virtual. <laughs> no, not at all. I would argue you need them to make it successful, Absolutely. right? Because I, I think, you know, if you have a person standing in front of a screen, even if it's the most exceptional LED wall volume in the world, you know, you, you essentially you have a foreground and you have a background, you know, and I think that can feel like what it is. And I think one of the exciting things about it, to, to Sherry's point, is you still need an art department because you're still going to need to build something of a set. Sure, you might be building, you know, it, you might build, you used to build a set and then put a green screen up and extend it. You know, this is just the logical extension of that, where you're going to build a little bit of set and then the LED wall is going to extend it. And I think having that physical interaction with your uh, performers and things in the real space before you even get to the plane of the screen, that's what really sells that image. That's what really makes it feel real. And so all those people are for sure going to still be needed, uh, even in a, in a virtual production. Although I do think for a minute, everyone thought, oh, this is a way to make a movie with, you know, sort of three nerds and a computer bank and an LED screen and we won't need a movie crew. And, and I think people are coming around to realizing it, it's, it's, it's not that at all. You know, it's just adding, it's adding a new technology to what is already a production workflow. Really well said. I mean, that's absolutely um, correct. You, you still need all of the talent that you expect in physical production, because guess what? It is physical production with a virtual element to it. What it's doing is changing some of the order that we do things and bringing some things more up front. But you still need people making props, people making sets. Um, some of the sets are, uh, are virtual, some of the sets are real, but they are now in physical production, right? Some of the sets are real, some of them are going to be put in later in post. Now they're put in put in up front. We still need, you know, the best DPs to, to make it look beautiful. We still need great costumes. It's, it's all, all what you would expect in physical production you need in, in a, a volume shoot because it is physical production. In some ways, it's even more so. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a lot of cinematographers who say this is great because I'm instead of lighting for a green screen where I have no clue what the final frame is going to look like, I can actually see if my if my fill light is matching what's on the back wall because it's right mm -hmm. there as opposed to just where I think it's going to be. So yeah. exactly. Okay, so here we go. Uh, next question, and we've kind of been talking about this a little bit already, but um, just to kind of lean into it, um, virtual production was already gaining significant attention towards the end of 2019 into 2020, but it seems like uh, the pandemic has introduced a greater sense of urgency and accelerated its uptake. Um, can you speak to that and what does it mean for the future of filmmaking? Easy question. For me, the first and most obvious thing is location scouting um, and what, what virtual, uh, what game engine tools can bring to that process because in a world where we can't send people or, or prefer not to send people to locations, but we can get Google Earth data or some photogrammetry, or there's a local resource there who can do a bit of scanning. Um, that can be extremely powerful when you bring that into engine and explore it as a possible shooting location. It's not gonna be, you know, you're not gonna be able to say, well, there's a little bit of a hill here and we won't be able to put dolly tracks and you know it's not going to replace a tech scout um, but it it could be a good for, first step to to rule out some locations or rule in some locations and i do think that this is a good time for a lot of location managers to start figuring out how to collect that data for their areas and make that available to to studios and producers who might say we want to come shoot in your location can you send us this data do you have it in game engine uh, you know game engine ready type stuff and I think um, you know, the, the, the cost to capture it is, is just not that high. And I think it's gonna be worth it. And I think more people are gonna do it. And probably in the next couple of years, we'll have a lot of locations around the world just available to anyone to go and explore, uh, at least as, like I said, as a first cut to, to sort of rule things in or, or rule things out. 
I think we've all noticed that, you know, we had a lot of productions that were, uh, that were shooting and then we wanted to find new ways to be able to collaborate and engage our filmmakers while at home. And I think as, as everyone moved to work from home over the past, um, you know, six months, what's been amazing to see is how virtual production still enables this creative collaboration process uh, for, for filmmakers, instead of just doing 2D reviews versus video calls and, and, and remote reviews in that sort of way. Um, what's been what's been challenging and what has been lost is that physical connection of spatial context and being able to walk around a physical you know prop or a, a, a maquette or a, a foam core model and being able to judge uh, judge things that in planning mode in, in 3d context and and one of the things that uh, we were we did with you know three of our productions in there working with epic on on I think it was released now on 4.25 is the remote multi-user collaboration platform that, uh, that we're all kind of tapping into for, for that space. And what's been great is that it's unlocked for everyone the ability for a DP in New York to work with a VFX uh, studio in London, a director in Los Angeles to work with an apartment out in Japan. Um, and in, in the scale that we're working with at Netflix, we have all of our filmmakers around the world and we still have a studio in LA and we need to be able to continue that creative content creation in prep and in production. And I think these remote collaboration workflows is something that we're gonna see proliferate across our content and it's gonna be services that are gonna be offered. And I think it'll help bridge the gaps between our production timelines to keep things kind of moving um, in, in this time and beyond. So. Yeah, I'd echo both of those as far as Amazon Studios. We've been using a lot of tools and, and the asset, of, the, the, the understanding of utilizing it for scouting, uh, but then also collaboration with different filmmakers and other throughout the globe, being able to bring them all into one spot and be able to look at assets, look at look at scenes and be able to kind of decide and make decisions without having to be together, especially where, you know, they're global. A lot of them are flying in certain locations currently. So you're able to kind of have that real time review and real time ex experience without having to be in the same room. And that, that goes a long way for us to be able to move forward on a lot of productions that, you know, traditionally we probably wouldn't be able to if we weren't utilizing these tools. For the first time, for a lot of us, I think we had to say no to filmmakers about things, not, well, how about this or yes and. And so what virtual production represents to me and, and to a lot of my colleagues is, okay, this is what, this is the hand. Dealt, but we can achieve your your vision this way and it keeps the keeps the productions rolling for lucasfilm that's exactly the the case for us as well we were able to keep momentum going in our development knowing that we were planning for volume shoots which which do have um obviously we don't need to travel huge crews everywhere we can be a bit more controlled about who is on the volume because the volume itself can be run from another room you know and and we're remoting in so we could more easily meet the social distancing guidelines earlier for some of our productions with the volume so we, we were able to keep up that momentum um so i do think Noah, that it that it has accelerated the adoption for those two reasons just a, a more controlled environment and the ability to not have to worry about the travel in, in in a time when we really can't travel and and i also think it's accelerated this cross platform multimedia content creation because as you're creating for the volume in a real time and engine you can also then uh, create a game and and create and put that environment into the volume and then shoot a series from the game and there is going to be so much um, crossover from the the assets that we create because we we are able to use similar tools or the same tools in many in many cases. Absolutely, I mean it has been very disruptive. Um, uh, nine months ago, I knew very little about streaming, and now I run this crazy TV studio out of my. Not in my dining room, but um, here we are. It seems, but it seems like a lot. It seems like what I hear from a lot of people is that um, a lot of these new workflows that came out of necessity will possibly will probably outlast the pandemic because there are actually better ways of working, as it turns out. Yeah, I hope I hope it helps. I think instill a culture of planning that I think we were all doing, uh, but it may have taken for granted a little bit. And and I think through this process. Uh, we are helping our filmmakers see their vision sooner and helping our studio executives uh, get a better sense of how their content is to be produced. And 
you know, even using visualization as a means to be able to figure out how much of a set you need to build uh, for traditional physical production, but also to, uh, because we have to be very mindful of construction and also planning where crews need to be on set through pretty much like a safety viz process effectively to make sure everyone is, is secure and safe. There's a variety of these sort of workflows that if you bring these filmmakers into the process early and you bring the cre content creation process in early, you actually can plan out a cut of your film before you actually make your film or your TV show or whatever you have. And that's a, that's a big value that I, that I hope stays, um, that, that culture stays, um, you know, beyond, uh, beyond all of this. I think the fix it and prep aspect is really kind of picking up, picking up uh, speed with uh, virtual production for sure. That's important to touch on because I think a lot of us have worked with um, a lot of range of directors of, of different kinds of personality types. And I think it's one thing to say, well, this technology just pushes, you know, it's true. It pushes a lot of the decision making up front. And I think there's probably many of us who have worked with filmmakers for whom that might not be the right fit. I think um, that process is not gonna work for every type of filmmaker. Um, some filmmakers want to sort of go away for a little bit, think about it, design it maybe with a, a, a group of a few key creative partners and then come back to the broader crew and say, this is what we wanna do, how do we execute it? Um, and that's a little different from, from using a virtual production tool where you kind of have to say, look, what do you want? Cause we gotta put it in there and that's what it's gonna be. And I do think we will find that there's still a little bit of casting involved and there's still a little bit of knowing the right personality types to introduce to this technology to be able to leverage it in the best way. And I think what comes along with that is the development of tools to make it really, really easy to use. You know, when it gets to the point where a director and a DP um, and maybe a production designer can really just use something like a game controller very simply with very little explanation and with very little uh, or very few people watching them, I think that's gonna be an important milestone where how we can really start to unlock this thing's potential. Because right now it does take a certain level of support to make that multi-user editing system really effective. And I think uh, I'm excited about when we can actually send a laptop or an iPad to the director and say, have at it, come back with something when you're ready so that you've had your chance to explore without feeling like, you know, we've got five or six people on the clock sort of watching you do it. Exactly. There, there's, there's always going to be a discovery process that more filmmakers want to lean into than others. So uh, as, as a follow-up to that, um, assuming that we all agree that virtual production is the wave of the future, or at least will play a key part in the future of filmmaking, uh, what would you like to see uh, happen? What would accelerate it or take it to the next level for, for you? When the, when the filmmakers have that aha moment and they realize what the tool can do from that for them um, in the privacy of their own home without hundreds of people watching them on set and they can figure out their, uh, their vision and we can convert traditional filmmakers into embracing the technology and realizing it's actually to their benefit and to the movie's benefit, for me, that's, that'll be a great moment. I think the experiential learning is going to be the biggest benefit uh, to everyone. It's it's impossible to explain to someone what it what it's like to put a VR headset on uh, for a production designer to walk through their set physically and be and have that spatial context of how big the frame is going to be and how tall the castle is going to be on there. And until we go through and do the hard work of educating our filmmakers and our creatives and our production process and our producers it's gonna be a challenge. And I, I think it, it take, it's gonna take a lot of effort to be able to do that. And I think it's a worthwhile effort to do so because I mean, we're all about to get uh, LiDAR scanners in our in our iPhones and, and iPads. And I, I straight up got a, uh, a text message from a visual effects supervisor on a set, taking a LiDAR scan from their iPad and texting it to them and having someone AR just on their iPad. This is just tech, the straight up iMessage AR kitting into their room and doing a room and doing a virtual location scout. And I think all these notions are going to get easier and easier year on year, but it's going to take the, the, the brave few to take those leaps of faith. And then over time, disseminating that information to more and more of our creatives to be able to better understand the process. And I think through that experience, only when you step onto a volume or put a VR headset on, show a DP, a virtual camera, and explain the value of the process, uh, to be able to cut your film and, and see your content in that sort of way, 
um, it lends your shots without renting, uh, you know, get it, renting a kit. There's all these sort of, you know, positive valuations that um, the investment on the upfront starts to make more financial sense and, and a planning sense once you start reallocating the schedules and the budgets in, in an appropriate way to make it successful. So hopefully through democratization that, that helps. I think you're exactly right, Garish. In fact, we've, we've noticed it every time we've had a director working on the stagecraft volume, they don't want to go back, you know, the, it says, which is a good thing, right? <laughs> the, the, the fact that they, they see the power of, of um, the methodology, I was going to say the technology, and it's, it's partly technology, but it's mainly methodology um, and flexibility. When, once they see what they can do, then um, they tend to ask for that again. And the more people in the curative process, as well as the, as we were talking about before, more people that can come into having these virtual production skill sets to be able to run these volumes so there's more availability. Um, but the, the more creatives use the, the volume, then they will want to use it again and it will get, it, it, it'll, um, it'll, become just a ubiquitous in, in terms of one of the tools that is available to um, get these stories up on screens. And they tell two friends and they tell two friends <laughs> and they tell two friends. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And really, it's going to be at the production side, too. It's, you know, these line producers, creative execs, you know, as I noted at the beginning, virtual production awareness is kind of what I'm calling it, of just them understanding the workflow and the benefits and then getting the creative filmmakers involved. And them, you know, like you said, once they once they do it, they don't want to go back. And, you know, just getting that hook and a lot of these different, uh, you know, stakeholders throughout the process is definitely key. And that education is key over the next, you know, 6, 12, 18 months to really kind of to manage it. And to speak for, you know, 2020 and, and going forward as far as the, you know, the uptake of, of interest in this, I really think that, you know, technology is going to be a driving force too. the innovation of, of how things are used and how they're looked at. I mean, like I said, at the beginning, we had a, a, a line producer that wasn't sure about it and we did a little demo for him and he understood it. And in a recent project, that same line producer was involved in a project where we actually built a small set. It's virtual, it's a virtual production set, but mostly out the windows and stuff like that. So it's pretty straightforward and not a huge volume wall, but they built the set in Unreal. So they're able to do camera angles and really kind of play with it and, and, and learn a lot about what they could do with the volume wall with the set they had they were going to be constructing. So I'm starting to see the integration now and, and that awareness happening. But no, it's going to take a lot to kind of really convince a lot of these traditional filmmakers who are used to just building sets and shooting on them. And I think the budget aspect is no one we really haven't touched on today, but the idea of how to how to move that money. You know, it's not, okay, I'm not building physical sets, but now I'm building CG sets. How does that work? And, and what's that going to cost me? You know, and then the, so a lot of them kind of look at virtual production right now as, oh, that's just really big and expensive. We don't need all that you know and how many days can i shoot on it what setups do i need so there's a lot of that education too as we get into it, i think is critical to kind of bring these all these different stakeholders over to the virtual production uh aspect and the more the more creatives come in and um use the volume the better it's going to get you know i i cannot understate the importance of having john favreau's vision driving what we did on the mandalorian his, his vision, his knowledge, his ability to work with, with ILM to, to hone the, the technology, but also hone the process was invaluable. And every single director and DP and that, com that comes in makes it better. It's gonna make every single volume out there better. Um, and I think that that's another thing that's going to accelerate the process too, because it'll be increasingly the tool that, that, that they want to use because they've helped craft it. We need to help define a minimum viable product for a lot of these services, virtual location scouting, virtual cinematography, uh, on-set compositing in camera visual effects. There needs to be a minimum viable product um, that helps uh, our filmmakers uh, understand and easily access to that. And I think uh, there's an effort of helping build guidelines and best practices that the, the few that have been able to, to march those first steps into the processes, uh, there's a responsibility to be able to help proliferate a series of guidelines and best practices for the industry at large to learn. And I think there's some really basic things like agreeing on terminology 
just the fundamental nature of what is virtual production. Do we call it in-camera visual effects? What is simulcam? What is, you know, there's there's some fundamental basic things that will help producers, line producers, um, you know, production executives, creatives, just understand, uh, you know, outside of what they may see on YouTube, they can see uh, when they walk on through said they know what they're asking for um, in this sort of process, so. I think that can't be um, overstated that since this is such a new way of approaching filmmaking, it's combining a lot of things that have existed for a while, but just the, the, the entire package, there's still a lot of room to define not only the terminology, but how the tools work. And that's, you know, that's an opportunity above and beyond just the creative side of filmmaking is like you're actually helping to define the workflows and build how people will do this moving forward as it becomes more and more mainstream. This has been a fabulous, great discussion. Very excited about everything that we've talked about. Where do you, you know, where do you see it now? Where do you see it going? And, you know, what has you most excited? Yeah, no, again, I, I just want to say thanks to Epic for, for having this panel. I think discussions like this are super important, especially with people from diverse backgrounds and, and you know, different skill sets to be able to say, this is how we think these tools, this is how we think the game engine is being used now. This is how we, we see it going to be used. This is how we would like it to be used. Um, you know, at my studio, we have a lot of very, very excited people about this. And we have a lot of really smart people um, working together to say, how can we make the most of it? And what would we need more to be able to employ it uh, or deploy it? And I think for all the people out there who are learning to get into this technology, I think I would say, we want you, we need you, <laughs> you know, build the tools, make this thing easier, make it really, uh, I hate to use the term idiot proof, so that we can just bring filmmakers in, no matter what their background, no matter how tech savvy they are, and just say, look, have at it, explore it, it's a sandbox. Um, take this thing that's in your head and use these tools to translate it into your vision so that creative executives can see what you have in mind so that your creative filmmaking partners can say, oh, I know how we're going to, I know how we're going to execute this story you're trying to tell, you know, help us bring these things and, and get them in the hands of filmmakers. That's, that's what we really want to do. We want to, we want to bring more stories to light faster, uh, easier and with less overhead. And that's what we're hoping that uh, the game engine and, and tangential tools like it, uh, which are all lumped into you know virtual production. That's what we're hoping for. This is such a collaborative industry. And um, I think when we all get behind something, it's going to just make it better. Um, I also want to say that I'm incredibly grateful to work with a filmmaker like John Favreau and work in a studio like Disney and Lucasfilm that, that had the foresight and and the courage to jump into a technology like this before it was a proven at all and took a huge leap of faith. Um, and I think Man the Mandalorian, the success of the Mandalorian is, is the result of that. And I'm incredibly grateful. So what I'm looking forward to is seeing where we go next, you know, already knowing that we we learned so much on Mandalorian season one. We built that into the volume um, and the processes for season two. Um, and that's already a leap forward. And so the more and more filmmakers that come into this technology, it's going to go on in leaps and bounds. And I mean, in, I'm incredibly excited about that. I'd like to say that I, I just really would like to recruit more um physical production, executives, line producers, people that are driving the methodology for how a, a project is produced into the conversation so that it the, the definition between production and visual effects and virtual production kind of just all becomes um, one tool set. And I'll piggyback on that. I mean, uh, first of all, thank you, Epic, for, for hosting this. And this really is something that's a, a tool to innovate and to really push forward. And, and, and you know, where we're at today is not where we're going to be six or 12 months from now on utilizing the volume walls, how they're utilized and just different aspects of application of the technology. So I'm excited for that and to see where it goes uh, in the future for filmmaking uh, and all different aspects and, and definitely adding lots of other people to the crews and the diversity of that and, and, and being able to to give opportunities and, and educate people throughout the globe on virtual production and utilizing it for all different types of projects, uh, you know, features, TV. I think there's going to be a world there where there's going to be a, a baseline usage uh, going forward, especially with COVID. It, it's definitely, I think, a way to, to utilize tool sets and, and shoot without having a risk involved for the most part. I would add that the glass ceiling has been shattered and we'll see more filmmakers effectively using the tools that Zemeckis and Cameron and Favreau have, have pioneered. And, you know, the biggest takeaway that, you know, I've learned in, in my time at Netflix is 
is virtual production is truly global. And there are filmmakers in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, in India, Korea, Japan, Brazil, Mexico, that all want to tap into the same workflows that our, our biggest filmmakers want to use. And now with, with the tools that we've been talking about today, they have the ability to start stepping into that world. And when you start seeing the fil these filmmakers' eyes light up and these productions start to think differently about the way that they produce in, in all these uh, you know, diverse and global markets, it's, it's a different way to think about production if the first time you're ever using this tool was virtual production. And so I think we'll start to see that more and more um, continue to change and hopefully it'll help you know, democratize this. It'll help bring new filmmakers and global filmmakers and global artists into the fold in this sort of way. So, um, so, so thankful for this conversation with, with everyone here.